Ahoy there, fellow Bible nerds. Today I'm kicking off a video series on how history outside the Bible supports the stories in the Gospels and Acts. There are lots of skeptics out there who like to dismiss Acts as mere fiction and say that Luke never really traveled with Paul, but they might want to think twice. I'm going to be jumping back and forth a bit in Acts over the next few videos, and weirdly enough, we're going to start at the end of the book. So in Acts 27, we're treated to this gripping account of Paul's turbulent journey and shipwreck. Let's check it out. In verses 3 through 6, we read about how they start off in Sidon, where Julius the centurion shows some unexpected kindness by letting Paul catch up with his buddies for a bit. Then they hit the seas, hugging the coast of Cyprus to shield themselves from the relentless winds. After navigating through Sicilia and Pamphylia, they finally dock in Myra, Lycia. And guess what? Right there, they find a ship heading straight for Italy, just what they needed. Now, here's where it gets interesting, historically speaking. Colin Hemmer, a classical historian, shed some light on Myra's significance. He points out that it was actually a major port for Alexandrian corn ships, precisely where Julius would expect to snag a ride to Italy. Plus, it had this fancy Hadriatic granary showcasing its official importance. Myra was basically the official gateway port for ships coming from the east, like Patara was from the opposite direction, and we'll talk about Patara in future videos. Now, you might think, okay, Eric, I'm bored to death, so what? But here's the thing. It's not like Luke had access to Google or Wikipedia to just look up stuff about Myra. It's these kind of details that really amp up the credibility of Acts as a historical document. But you might say, well, come on, it was probably just common knowledge. All right, well, let's just hang tight a little bit and keep unraveling this gripping story in Acts 27. So verses 13 through 14 paint this picture of the crew sailing close to the shores of Crete, thinking they're in for a smooth ride. But boom, out of nowhere, this ferocious northeasterly wind, a real tempest, comes barreling down from the land. Now, here's where things get fascinating. There's historical proof actually, again, backing up Luke's account. You see, meteorologists tell us that there's this well-documented wind that sweeps over Crete from the northeast, especially around the time of the Day of Atonement in the fall, just like Acts 27.9 mentions. Then, here comes the real kicker. Acts 27.16 talks about how this storm blows them off course toward this tiny little island called Cauda. What's mind-blowing is that Cauda sits more than 20 miles west-southwest from where the storm hit them in the Bay of Masara. Now, this isn't something that you could just guess. Back then, pinpointing islands this far out was like finding a needle in a haystack. Colin Hammer points out that even the ancient bigwigs like Pliny, the encyclopedist, and Ptolemy, that ancient cartographer, couldn't get the location of Cotta right. Pliny had it way too far east, and Ptolemy placed it way too close to the western end of Crete. Luke's got him beat by a mile. Now, hold on to your hat because there's even more to this particular tale. James Smith, a seasoned sailor from the 19th century, really dug deep into Paul's maritime misadventure. He's convinced that the shipwreck described in Acts 27-28 through happened smack dab on the island of Malta. But he doesn't stop there. Oh no, he goes full-on detective mode. Smith meticulously pours over the text of Acts, comparing it with accounts of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean by folks like Josephus and Lucian. Plus, he throws in a boatload of nautical knowledge about winds, water depths, and coastlines. And you know what? His conclusion is pretty solid. Luke's account isn't just some fisherman's tale. It's got authenticity written all over it. Now, I won't bore you with all the nitty-gritty details that Smith lays out, but let me give you just a small taste. He uncovers a bunch of little clues scattered throughout the text that all point to the same conclusion. So here's the scoop. Luke doesn't provide a ton of detailed information about the journey from Cotta to Malta and Acts. However, by piecing together the clues that he does give, it's possible to roughly estimate the ship's course and speed. It seems that they were sailing northward, trying to stay as close to the wind known as Euraculo as safely possible. This strategy, called tacking, would cover approximately 476 miles over a little more than 13 days, assuming a drift rate of around 1.5 miles an hour. As Acts 27.27 describes, on the 14th night of the voyage, they found themselves very close to the island of Malta. Bingo. Here's where things get really interesting. Luke throws in this fancy Greek nautical term, bolasantes, which basically means that they were taking soundings. The numbers he gives match up perfectly with the timeline between spotting the breaking waves near Cora, about 20 fathoms, and realizing they were heading straight for some serious shoreline trouble at about 15 fathoms. And get this, in Acts 28.7, 7, 
Luke refers to a guy named Publius as the first man of the island. Now, that might sound like some random title, but it was actually the official designation on Malta, backed up by archaeological inscriptions and all. But wait, there's even more to this fascinating puzzle. Smith goes the extra mile in his analysis. Not only was the narrator of this epic voyage and shipwreck an eyewitness, but he was also a landsman. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that Luke wasn't some sea-savvy sailor who's making up this story about his journey. No, he was a regular guy, just observing and reporting with a keen eye. Let me break it down with a few examples. When Luke mentions the Greek terms chalisantes to scales, he's not just throwing out some fancy nautical words. He's actually describing the crew stripping down any unnecessary rigging. Now, a seasoned sailor might know this was to get the ship on the right track, but Luke, being a landsman, might have missed the navigational significance, yet he nails the observation of what's happening on deck. Then there's also this moment of despair in Acts 27.20. Crew spirits plummet when they are faced with a grim reality. They likely miss Sicily, and the faint hope of making it to the Tunisian coast unscathed dwindled, but Luke doesn't give us this play-by-play of why. It's like he's capturing the emotion without spelling out the cause, almost like a bystander watching the scene unfold. And check this out. When they cast anchors from the stern in Acts 27-29, it's a textbook emergency move to prevent the ship from being battered sideways by the waves. But Luke reports it without highlighting its significance, perhaps because he didn't fully grasp the unusualness of the action. Even when they're lightening the ship in Acts 27-38 to make a final desperate run for the shore, Luke doesn't dive into the reasons behind keeping grain earlier or tossing it now. He's just laying out the facts as he saw them. Now, why is this all important? Because it shows that Luke wasn't just regurgitating some sailor's tale that he got from reading Homer's Odyssey or something. No, he was a first-hand witness, a regular Joe caught up in extraordinary events, and his meticulous yet unpolished account adds a layer of authenticity that's hard to match. This is just the beginning of our journey, exploring how secular history backs up the Gospels and Acts. I've got loads more of juicy nuggets lined up for future videos, so don't miss out. Be sure to subscribe, make sure you're getting notifications, And stay tuned because we're just scratching the surface here. Thanks for watching.